week. I have a second. Yes. All in favor. All in favor, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you needed help with the math, that was several of them were eight women, 16 hands, and 80 fingers, just in case you needed help with the math. You guys can go on down. I'm so thankful today to to be able to welcome Sean Robinson to our pulpit today. Uh, we've been planning this for oh six months or more that uh, we put this together that Sean would come visit us this week, the weekend. So I'm delighted he's here. Uh, he his duties at the conference office have changed a little bit through the year. How long have you been here? Two years? Just over a year. Just over a year. Uh, so he's been changing just a little bit, so I'll let him tell you whatever he wants to about that. But his primary task at the conference office is uh, plan giving and entrust services. And recently it was added to him that he would do some development work for the conference. And so I think you will enjoy him very much this morning and that you will enjoy what he has to share this morning. So welcome, Sean. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's good to be in church this morning and also to be here in Williamsport. And uh, thank, Pastor Frank, thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, thank you, church, for the warm welcome. I breezed in rather rapidly this morning because I, there was an accident on the interstate and I took a detour following my GPS. And by the time the GPS took me back under the interstate, it was all clear. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. For technology, so it's, uh, these things are always very helpful and uh, always get us to our, our respective appointments on time. It's good to, see, to be here. It's good to see a lot of warm, friend, friendly faces. Jen um, is keeping a tabs on us at the conference office with, that, with, our, um, with our steps. Um, I broke a three-mile record, Jen, yesterday in going running, so I'm praising the Lord for that. Andrew works with us in the, in the association side and plan giving trust services side with accounting. Melinda, it was great to see you here um, on the piano. Melinda goes back to our new bold days. Um, praise the Lord, amen. So it's amazing how, how we have the opportunity to, uh, to bump into so many, uh, many friends um, over the years as well. Um, I, ha I do have a wife and two children, and uh, unfortunately, they couldn't be with me today. They, they were committed somewhere else, um, so unfortunately, I couldn't bring them, but uh, maybe next time, um, if you invite me back again, I'll, I'll, it will be a pleasure for me to, uh, to bring them and to undo the sin of not having them with me this morning. Um, I want to share with you briefly something that's very important. I, I carry three responsibilities um, for you at the conference. I have association, plan giving and trust services and development. I want to say thank you uh, to you for um, returning your tithes and your offerings. So, you know, I believe as a church, we are notorious for not saying thank you. And uh, I believe that gratitude is something that should stem from love, and because of who God is, um, He's the one that motivates us to be grateful, amen? And, and so I want to say thank you, because the church doesn't operate without um, you. It, we are the church. It's not the pastor or the conference. We are the church. We're a collective group of people that come together, and we are united as we, as we carry out that sense of mission that God has called us to. And, and we understand the importance of what the Seventh-day Adventist Christian gospel is about. But the reality is that the gospel is not preached um, without cost. There, there's cost associated with teaching and preaching. We need to operate our schools. We need to do evangelism. All these things have expenses associated with them. And I want to say thank you to you because by returning your tithes, you're, you, you, able, you enable uh, the conference and, and the churches across the conference of which we are one here to carry out ministry by, by, by um, covering the salaries of the teachers and, and, and the pastors and the administration. We have a network of churches around the world where we interrelate through the general conference and, and the unions and, and the division. And, and that gives us an opportunity to be in places that many other churches would like to be but can't be because of the resources that we're able to, to place into different places. But that happens because of you. 
And, and what happens because of you is the ministry here in Williamsport. That happens because of your dedication to preaching the gospel and ensuring that the people of this town get to hear a message about Jesus Christ, a message that points them to Jesus as the one who came and died on the cross for them. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's because of you. And, and I want to thank you because the reason that you return your tithes and your offerings is, is not because you're trying to win favor with God. It, it, it stems from the understanding, the biblical understanding, that everything that God has created in this world belongs to God, and He has made us stewards or custodians of what is His. But it's all, it's all His. Everything that is here belongs to God. He is the owner. And notice Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. It's His because He created it. That's why it's His. Everything that we have is His. Even us, because He created us too. We are His. I want to say thank you. Because not only have you been faithful in returning your tithes and offerings, but from a plan giving and trust services standpoint, over the past five years, we have received through the conference just under a million dollars in bequests. That is gifts out of estates because people made plans in advance to return a portion of their estate to the Lord's work. Most of that funds went on. It didn't stay at the conference. Most of that, those funds were directed to different churches across the conference. And in some instances, it was, it was money that was needed to, in, in order to build things like schools. That's what this type of money was used for. So I want to say thank you. Recognizing that behind every bequest is also the pain of the loss. Because the family that, that gave the money in the bequest also is dealing with the loss of the, the family member who has died. So we recognize the gift associated with the pain, but also appreciate the way that we can continue to, f to further the interests of God. Amen? You know, the funny thing is that the world wants us to believe that everything is about us. Magazines point us to me, but God is our steward. He's the owner. He, God is the owner. I'm the steward. God is responsible for our success, and God holds me, us, responsible with what we, for what we do with what He has given us. Amen? That's why we continue as a church, as a conference, to support the plan giving and trust services because we want to enable that sense of, of ownership and mission through our, our work. There are three priorities, major priorities that we have in our conference. Those are evangelism, continuing to preach the gospel, children and children's and youth ministries, young adults ministries, and education. These, this is a very strong uh, priority for us. The, the, the third one is, is important, but it's not the priority, but it comes as a result of doing one and two. Uh, and that is that we need school buildings and we need church buildings in order to have a facility, a place, a tool where we can function in our work and in our ministry as, as a church community across the conference. Now, here's the thing. The thing is that as you look at your estate, sometimes people say, but pastor, I don't need to think about that until I get old. Well, you know, the reality is I hit 50 this year, and I still don't feel old, but I know I'm getting older. Amen? <laughs> I'm just about to write my third estate plan document. Why? Because throughout our lifetime, our needs, our priorities change, and, and they develop based on the situations and the circumstances and who are part of our family at a particular point in time. But the reality is this. If you don't have an estate plan in place, whether that's a trust or, or a will, the reality is that the government decides what happens to your estate. You die intestate. And I don't believe any of us want that to happen, amen? And here's two reasons why. Number one, you can't direct any charitable giving when you die intestate. And number two, where you have children who are minors it's very important to have an estate plan that directs who the guardians are going to be. Otherwise, the government determines who the guardians will be of the children. Did you hear what I just said? This is very important, friends. You don't, it doesn't automatically go to your family. 
the responsibility will be determined by the CPS, Child Protective Services, and the family courts. And they'll have to go through a process of adoption. So in order to mitigate against that, a very simple way to do that is to create a will that states very clearly who the guardians will be of the children. Can I hear an amen? Amen? amen. I'd like the deacons this morning to hand out a response card. I'm not going to ask them to hover and wait for that today. If, you want, if I can help you, if we can be of assistance at some point in the future or this week, fill it in, hand it to me at the end of the service, or... Um, put, you know, mail it into the conference office, however we, or email us. However we can reach out to you, please um, do that, and we'll be happy to come and sit in your home and talk to you about what your plans are for your family and how your priorities are being met and established and taken care of in your estate plan document. Amen? That's all I want to say is about plan giving and trust services this morning. Now we, I want to get back into something that's very important, God's Word. Amen? As we, uh... okay, so this morning I've entitled the sermon, What No God, Esther, What No God. Let's bow our heads in, in, in prayer. Father, as we come before you this morning, we're ever mindful of the beauty of your word. We're ever mindful, Lord, that wherever we stand in history, Lord, you have a plan for this world being reunited with you, but also, Father, you have a plan for us, and you want to use each one of us to fulfill that plan and that purpose. Lord, as we, as we look at the story, as we read the passages from the Bible, we invite your presence, not just into this, in this place, but Lord, we invite you into our hearts and our minds. Lord, we invite you to rest with us. We invite the Holy Spirit Lord, here. And as we do so, Father, Lord, we want your wisdom and your grace to play out in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the reasons I, I like to fly is because at some point in the conversation, as you're talking to the people around you, at some point in the conversation, the people are going to ask you the question, what do you do? And, and I can't wait until somebody asks me that question because the first thing I do is to remind them that I'm a pastor. And, and at that point, you see the look in their eye, oh my, what did we talk about? Is there anything that I just said that was incriminating to that pastor? And then I follow it up by saying, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And, and that just adds the nail into the wood because at that point, they're looking at me and saying, oh my, he's a pastor, and it's that cult. <laughs> Praise the Lord, amen? But you know, friends, I believe as, as uh, we are living at a time in history. We're living at a time in history where religion and Christianity is being pushed to the fringes of people's ideologies. Where Christians are being treated as though they are the exception, that they're, they're the weirdos, instead of understanding that Christian philosophy has been what has created a sense of normality in our world for so long. And as we see um, prophecies unfold before our eyes, and as we see things happening around us, it points us to the reality that, that only Jesus Christ, only God has the solution for the issues that we face in this world. And it's only going to be when Jesus Christ returns in the clouds of glory that he will solve all the problems that we have in this world. But the, re, but the question comes, as we live in, our, in this 21st century environment, the question comes, how do we actually live in an environment of post-Christian or anti-Christian sentiment when we just want to display and be Christians? And that's why this morning, I want us to look at the book of Esther. Because the story of Esther, I believe, is a story, actually, although it was written several thousand years ago or plus, I believe it's a story that's about us, our time. And the reason that I believe it fits our time is because at that point in time, the Israelites were in captivity, and 
this, this story happens in an environment where Esther and her uncle, her cousin Mordecai, neither of them talk about God. In fact, in the story, in the book, there is no mention of God or God's name once. That's why I've called it, What No God? Because the story is about an opportunity or a time when atheism, agnosticism, and other different types of pagan religions were prevalent and worshiping God was seen as a secondary item. Doesn't that sound familiar to our time and our day? I'm also intrigued because as I read the story, I believe that this is a, t- a story um, that Hollywood should capture in a film. They haven't done it yet. And here's why. If you don't mind me pointing out, it's filled with drama, suspense, romance, murder, jealousy, and anger. There's villains, there's um, heroes, and there's a happy ending. Just to add a twist in the story as we're reading through it. So if you don't mind me this morning, I would like to give you the Sean Robinson Reader's Digest version of the story. Because I want to get some, to some very important points. And if I dwell too much on the story, we're going to lose the points. Amen? So can you come along with me this morning? And, and then this afternoon, in your copious spare time, you're going to read the story and fact-check everything that I've said. Amen? All right, so here's the story. The story has four main characters. There's the king of Persia, the country that the Israelites were captive in. There's Haman, the prime minister, who who is a very important person. We're going to talk about him in a few minutes. There's Esther, the Jewish maiden who is um, in captivity uh, there. And then there's Esther's righteous cousin or, or uncle called Mordecai. So here's what happens. Politically correctness aside, the king gets rid of the last queen. He decides that for whatever reason, she isn't functioning um, the purposes that he desires her to have. So he eliminates her. A little short while after that point in time, he decides that he's getting lonely. And, and so there's a committee. They must have been good Adventists. There's a committee that's put together, and that committee decides that the way to solve the problem this problem that the king is experiencing, this heartache that he's experiencing, is to cr- conduct a series of beauty pageants across the entire empire to find the most beautiful woman to replace as the queen. You get the point. It's not very politically correct, right? So that's what they do. They, they embark on this process across the empire with all these different beauty, beauty pageants and at, at one point in the story, Esther is talking to Mordecai, and they're discussing these beauty pageants, and he encourages her to put her name forward for one of them. Now, rightly or wrongly, it gets to the point where she goes through the processes, and eventually, she is chosen to be the queen of Persia. Can I hear an amen? Can you imagine the irony of that situation. Here she is, a captive maiden, and now she is the queen of the empire. A little bit odd, isn't it? But that's not enough. When she becomes the queen, Mordecai, um, the righteous cousin, the uncle, finds out that there is a plot to eliminate the king. There's a, pl- and a plot to assassinate him. And so she tells, he, he, Mordecai tells um, Esther, who informs the king, who puts this plot to rest, prevents it from happening. And now, now Mordecai is left with a very um, interesting situation. Because Mordecai, who should have been rewarded for that, what he did, Mordecai is now let, um, uh, well, he's now basically treated wrongly. The king forgets to reward him. He owed him a reward, but the king forgets to reward him. Now think about that with me. 
You know, friends, today we're living in an environment where people believe they need to be rewarded. We're told we need to be rewarded. And rightly or wrongly, there are times in our life where things happen or don't happen that should happen. And sometimes that prevents us from being active in our ministry. We have no excuse. Mordecai didn't stop living. He didn't stop doing what he knew needed to be done because he wasn't rewarded. He lived out his life from that point on in the belief that God was in control. And at some point, even if it was when Jesus returns in the clouds of glory, at some point, the wrongs would be put right. Amen? At some point, God will put right the wrongs that happen in our lives. And at some point, the rewards that we are owed, we will be paid. Whether or not they happen here in this lifetime or when they happen when Jesus comes back again. The reality is, though, that God is in control. So now, what happens in the story is that Haman, this prime minister, he gets to a point where he decides that he is owed more than just the handshaking that acknowledges his presence as the prime minister. He wants to be worshipped, and he decrees that everybody should worship him, and as he goes around the empire wanting to be worshipped, there is one person that refuses to worship him, and that is Mordecai. And Mordecai says, it's very simple what he says. Mordecai says this. He doesn't come with 27 fundamental beliefs as the reason why. He simply says the reason that he will not worship her man is because he is a Jew. He says, I am a Jew. You know, today, friends, I'm a Christian. And that's why I want to do Christian things. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but that's why I want to do Christian things. Because I want to emulate Jesus Christ. I want to live by the priorities and the principles of Jesus. That's why I do those things. It's not because of 100 or different years of service. It's simply because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and I've chosen to be a Christian. That's why we do what we do. Can I hear an amen? Amen. You see, the problem is that sometimes we get so ingrained in the argument that we lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is we want everybody to meet Jesus in the clouds of glory. Amen? We want everybody to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's what we want to point people towards. Jesus Christ and not everything else. It's Jesus Christ who is our Lord and Savior. So Haman is not satisfied. And Haman decides that he's going to eliminate not just not just Mordecai, but he's going to eliminate all the Jews. And now in this um, story, now Mordecai comes to Esther. They're talking about the scenario, and they're trying to work out what to do. How do they resolve this problem with Haman? He's building the gallows all over the empire. And notice how this conversation turns. It says in Esther chapter 4 verse 16, it says of Esther, she says, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days or nights. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Now, I want you to notice a few things in this text. Number one, this is the closest point in the story where Esther and Mordecai talk about God. They're talking about fasting and praying. So who, do, who as Jews, we know that they were praying to God, God of God, Lord of Lords, the God Almighty. They understood who he was. That's where they're praying. They know that he alone is the one who will have a solution to this problem. 
But I want you to notice something else. It wasn't enough for Esther to be the queen, for her to go into the presence of the king. There was a protocol in place, and if she wasn't invited into the king's presence, even though she was the queen, that was enough for the king to order her to be eliminated. to die. So now Esther, in a sense, has a death sentence hanging over her no matter which way she looks, no matter which way she turns. Which way do you turn? What do you do? If I perish, I perish. Today in America, none of us are faced with that immediacy. But you know, friends, the decisions that we take today have an impact on our lives, not just today, but for eternity. The choices that we make, the priorities that we live by, who we worship, or whether we worship God, or whether we worship any other items, it's irrelevant, it's, or it's important because today, today might be that point where we accept Jesus and we didn't, and from that point on, we don't. Today is the day that we need to be right with God. So what happens? I believe that we live in our lives. I believe that we face what I call crisis of belief. There are points in our lives where you and I, as we're living our Christian experience, we are confronted with situations that are bigger than us. They're challenges that are so great sometimes that you know that you can't conquer the challenge. So the question is, how do you deal with that challenge? And, and it's more than just us individually because we deal with these things corporately as a family and corporately as a church and corporately as a community. We, we face points. There are points where, that we can look to and we can say that because certain decisions were made at that particular point in time, the, the, the subsequent consequences of those decisions led us in a particular road, down a particular path. So, as we live these crises of belief, how do we deal with them? Laura Schlesinger and Rabbi Stuart Vogel said this. They said, even those people who espouse a belief in God still often resist and resent the notion of specifically commanded behaviors. People often want the benefits of having a God for personal requests or crisis interventions. Did you get that? People want God when they need God for those uh, emergencies, but then the rest of the time she's saying that they don't need God. We don't want to live that way, do we? She goes on. And she says, and may use being a believer as a way to increase status, respect, and trust from others. That's not how we want to live, amen? Then she says, entering into a relationship with God is not just about the rewards we receive in this world or the next, but rather how we show God that we are serious about our relationship with Him. You see, friends, how we choose to live, the decisions that we make today, those affect the relationship that we have with the God who not only created us because He loves us, but redeemed us because He loves us and is coming back to this earth to claim us because He loves us. That's about a relationship and not switching God and on and off because we think that we need God at a particular point or juncture in our lives. Which is why our scripture reading that was so well read this morning is so important. Amen? Paul writes these words. He says, but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Did you get that? Paul is telling us that we need faith. Faith 
in order to build that relationship with God. Faith in order to understand what the relationship with God is about. And that when we come to God, when we believe in God, that He rewards us. That faith we are rewarded for. That faith, when we put it into practice, we are rewarded. And one of the ways that we are rewarded is that we diligently find Him when we seek Him. You see, friends, I believe that when we face those doubts, when we face those issues, when we face those situations, that faith is required. Faith is required in order to overcome the experience, the, the doubt, the challenge that comes. We need to Number two, recognize that the challenge has to be God-sized. Because if it is human-sized, we are not living by faith. All we're doing is living out what we think we can and can't do, rather than allowing God to do something really big in and through us. And God is in the business of doing big stuff. May I remind you, in the book of Genesis it tells us that God was the one who created the world and the universe. Amen? And John chapter 1 tells us, as, as John begins describing the way that Jesus comes into this world, John describes in chapter 1 that the one, the word that spoke the words of creation, that one was Jesus. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were completely in unity when they created, but the words, let there be, were emitted, John chapter 1 tells us, by the Word, Jesus Christ. Isn't that exciting? So you think about that. The one who came to redeem us is the one that spoke the words. So God isn't challenged by our inability or whether or not we get something that's too big for us. God can do things that are way bigger and better than anything that we can comprehend. Number three, what we do in response to God, so the revelation reveals what you believe about God. You know, friends, if we choose to live, if we choose to live by God, we have to. If we claim that we are Christians, we have to live as a Christian. And that's not one day a week. We're seven, we're not just seventh day Adventists, we're seven day Adventists. Amen? We don't just worship God on the seventh day, that's the day of worship. But our responsibility is to have a relationship with God every day of the week. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for a seven day a week seventh day Adventist. Number three, four, true faith requires action. You know, Ellen White talks about faith over 49,180 times. When God normally mentions something once, it's important. When he mentions it twice, he's raised his voice. By the time he's raised it th three times, he's shouting. So 49,180 times, God is trying to get our attention. He's trying to do something very big in our lives. Mark chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says, uh, Mark writes, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. What we do tells the world what we believe. James chapter 2, verse 26, James writes these words. He says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We have to live our lives in a way that we can truly experience faith at work. You see, friends, faith is not just a blind faith. I hear people tell, saying that faith is naive. Faith is far from naive. True faith is dependent on three things. Number one, a knowledge. We get our knowledge from the Bible. That's where we turn in order to understand who God is and what he writes about himself. Number two, a faith 
has to, um, rel- um, has to have belief. But you know, the interesting thing is that even when you believe, you're no better than the demons because Jesus said that the demons believe in the name of Jesus. So belief isn't enough. And yet that's where most of us stop. We take that knowledge, we take that belief, and we think that we are a Christian. But the whole point of faith is that you take the knowledge, you take the belief, and you put it into action. You live with God, you pray with God, you invite God into your life on a daily basis. True faith is putting not just the day, because we've prayed the day, into His hands, but it's putting every minute of every day into God's hands and inviting Him to do amazing things through us. That's faith. And no matter what we're confronted with, saying and looking at the issue and saying, God, you can lead me through this. You have a plan for this issue. And it's bigger and better than anything that I could imagine or believe was possible because of who you are and the unlimited ability to have a knowledge and an understanding and a will for this that far exceeds anything that I can come up with. No wonder, just the little examples of faith. The centurion that goes to Jesus, it happens several different times in the Gospels. But they go to Jesus, they're Gentiles, and yet they know that Jesus is the one that can resolve the problem. The disciples in the storm, there is Jesus sleeping in the boat. The storm is raging around them. They're trying to resolve the issue. None of them can. And then they turn to Jesus, he wakes up, and all he has to do is say, calm the storm, and the storm is calm. The storms in our lives, all we have to do is look at Jesus. He can calm them. The woman who came to be healed, she just knew that if she touched the very cloak of Jesus. She didn't even have to look at him, and he didn't have to look at her. All she had to do was just touch the cloak, and Jesus was going to heal her. That was enough. And the blind men, they had their own story, but they still came to Jesus. And Jesus healed them. And even though they didn't come back, except that one or two, right? They were still healed because of their faith and their trust that Jesus could do the things that were impossible. Gary Parker writes this. He says, If faith never encounters doubt, if truth never struggles with error, if good never battles with evil, how can faith know its own power? Do you get that? If we're not truly living our lives with Jesus, how can we truly understand the power of God to do unlimited things through us? He goes on, in my own pilgrimage, if I have chosen between a faith that has stared doubt in the eye and made it blink, or a naive faith that has never known the firing line of doubt, I will choose the former every time. Friends, what type of faith are you living? What type of relationship with God are you living so others around you can see Jesus Christ, not just as your Lord and Savior, but they can see that this Lord and Savior is alive and dynamic and at work today? So, how does that impact Esther? How does it impact Esther? Number one, God is in control. Can I hear a really big amen? Amen. God is in control. God is in control. Notice just some of the different texts. Psalm 23, verse 1, David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 146, verse 7, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord gives freedom to who? To the prisoners. The injustices of this world, God has a plan. And whether or not we committed sins, it's completely irrelevant because God's love says that He pays the price for those things and He wants us to repent. 
Amen? He wants us to repent of our sins, whatever it is. And it's only through Him that we have freedom. Otherwise, we have a death sentence. That's the reality of sin. Jeremiah 31, verse 35, I love this text. Thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. The majesty of God is so great that when he speaks, the creation responds to his power and his might. That's how great our God is. Paul records and quotes one, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, And as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Friends, God has a plan for you, and he has a plan for me, and he's in control. And it doesn't matter what the devil says or claims, And between now and when Jesus returns in the clouds of glory, believe me, friends, Jesus Christ is in control. God has a plan. Nothing surprises Him. Nothing outwits Him or outsmarts Him. God already has the solution long before we even realized there was a challenge or a problem. That's how great our God is. We don't serve a God who can be outsmarted or outwitted. And we don't serve a God who can be outloved. He is in control. Number two, never forget who you are, who Christ brought you to be. You are a child of God. Amen? Amen. Here's what I want you to do. I I want you to wake up in the morning And I want you to go and look in the mirror. And I want you to say, I am a child of God. And when you do that, I don't want you to look in the mirror and say, oh my, I'm a child of God. I want you to look in the mirror and say, I am a child of God. You were bought with a great prize. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and died on the cross for you. He paid the ultimate price And by his death on the cross, he covered your sin in its entirety and completely so that there was no debt left. That's who Jesus Christ is and who he called you to be. Notice how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 17. He says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. He's using a very personal term and name to describe the relationship between us as as those who have been bought with the price of of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a very personal term, a very personal relationship that he's describing here. But then notice what he says in verse 16. He says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Wow. You and me, It doesn't matter what we've done. What matters is who we know. What matters is what we believe. And what matters is what we have um, accepted as we believe that that death of Jesus on the cross is for us to cover our sins. And recognizing who God has called you and me to be. It doesn't matter what this world wants you to believe. You are a child of God. And Jesus Christ came to this earth to demonstrate what that relationship with you and with me truly looks like. Amen? He demonstrated it for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, God says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I think it's amazing that God 
would redeem us. I think that's amazing. But you know what always gets me even more is the fact that when God recreates the new Jerusalem, He does it here on this earth. Amen? He could put His capital city somewhere else in the universe. He could spin us off to the fringes, but He chooses to make this His capital city. You think about that. What a demonstration of His love for us, not just to us, but to the entire universe, what that will be. That's what He promised when He promised to make this His home. Number three, God's promises are trustworthy. Can I hear an amen? If, if you've been wondering why God has not answered your prayers, maybe you need to ask the question, am I truly praying them to God? Because often we're blaming God for not doing something in our lives, but the reality is that it's not God who's moved away from us, it's us who's moved away from God. Get back to where God is. Get back to inviting God into your life, not just at the end of the week, but through every step of every day. Walk it with God and invite God to be your partner in business, in your marriage, in, in your relationship with your children, in the jobs that you do. Whatever you are, do it with God, walking with Him on a day-by-day basis. You know, friends, Esther experienced God working in her life. Through a series of different maneuvers, she was able to take the issue to the king without having her head removed. And when she discussed the issue with the king, the king immediately understood what was going on. He took care of the issue. But what's more is he didn't just stop the execution of all the Jewish uh, people across the nation. He went another step further. He took care of Haman, the problem, and then he went one step further. You remember that Mordecai hadn't been taken care of. He wasn't rewarded from the first issue, and now he gets rewarded. Everything is done in God's time and in a way that brings honor and glory to God. Amen? Esther understood that. I want to share two last promises with you. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. In the deed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested, and you, are, you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. Jesus is promising that if we remain faithful, if we look to Him, that He will give us a crown of life. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out His name from the book of life, but I will confess His name before my Father and before His angels. Esther, Esther understood that God was not just some being that was out there in the universe. She understood that God was very present in her life. She understood that no matter what steps were taken, that God had a plan for her. Mordecai had the same relationship today God is inviting you and me to develop that faith. That faith where we understand that His plans and His purposes, the way He chooses to use you, He's going to do that. And He wants you. He wants you to experience that power and that might so that you can see the wonderful plans that you can have the assurances of their relationship and that you know that He truly is Abba, your Father. God bless you.